It's oh, done. Good job. <laughs> okay. Perfect. All right. So all right. Take one up. Okay. So this is part two of um, a talk that I started a few weeks ago, and we're focusing on the antebellum period of our church of the our church, and um, we're going to be uh, reviewing briefly some um, discussion about the founders and governance, and then talk more extensively about who may have built the church um, and the economics of, in Baltimore and how that relates to racism. Um, talk a little bit about the ministry of Robert Galbraith at this, as a case study, which we started last time and finishing it up, and introduce who is Elizabeth Love. Elizabeth who? Elizabeth Love. Oh. I have no idea. <laughs> well, you'll find out. Uh, last time we this met, the whole audience. There's online too. There's a few people online. Seven, eight people online. Ah, <laughs> I could have done that. <laughs> so, um, uh, as we we know that Henry and Anne uh, Grammy Turnbull were. Um, the original, the the major funders of our church, and we learned that um, his father was a Scottish immigrant, so he was a, um, a child of an immigrant. They were also Southern sympathizers and slaveholders, and had a couple of slaves between 840 and 60. Um, and what was that? They had yeah, Mr. What Tur was that about 60. They had about two, no, only two, which were more than likely house slaves. He had property, but not a plantation. He had, um, his wealth came from commerce from his wife. Um, and uh, the Auburn house was his home, which you see on the screen. Oh, we don't see it on the screen. Why is that? Uh, so we we do see it on ours. Oh, oh. Okay, can you see it now? No, you just switched views. Now we see all the slides at once. Okay, yeah, this is this is the slide view. Okay. Keep going. Okay, I clicked something. All right. Uh, so this his old mansion, Auburn House, is. Um, on the National Register, and the bottom slide is its current is present day, and it's on Towson University. And um, ah. uh, at the arranged a tea and a tour of the house for the Golden's people. Ah. maybe fifteen years ago. Oh, we could do that. Welcome. Hi. <laughs> uh, so there's some more pictures that um, I've found of his estate. And you can see the map there to see that it's only 120 acres. So again, it was not a plantation. It did not make a lot of money um, in farming. The, the wealth came from commerce. Um, and this was from, his, this is his, his grounds again, and a quote from the obituary. Henry Turnbull, one of the best citizens of Baltimore, died at his beautiful residence at Auburn. Through his efforts, Govan's Presbyterian Church was built and organized, which he was a ruling elder for many years. For many years, he was the ruling elder. The ruling elder. <laughs> okay, so as we learned last time, um, what this means is our founders, and there are others, but the bulk of the, the funding came from Mr. Turnbull, um, participated in keeping people in bondage and accumulated wealth at their expense. So by extension, our church was built on the backs of slave labor, even if the hands of those laborers did not directly place the stones of the walls. Um, he had nine children in 14 years. Uh, his first child was uh, a Confederate soldier. His, uh, so I'm not gonna go through all nine children. I'm gonna talk about some that have relationship to our church that we know of. So Ellen Turnbull was born in uh, 1844 when our church was founded. Um, and later she financed the, uh, what was a Sunday school building uh, in memory of her mother, Anne Bramey Turnbull in 1876. Then we have Lawrence who was actually born before her, but interestingly uh, at the wills of her, their parents, she had access to her inheritance before he did. <laughs> So uh, his contributions to the church came later. 
and he did a major expansion to build the church um, much as we know it today. Not all of it that we know today. Um, the sixth child, John Lyle Turnbull, we have a window to, and he died um, uh, in middle age. So this is his window to the glory of God and in loving memory of John Lyle Turnbull. Around 1908, the window was installed. And then lastly, there was another elder, Chester Bacchus, uh, who was also a Govins elder. And he was named after the minister at First Presbyterian. He was also a cotton broker. So, what about the labor? Um, here's our dear lady, uh, Michelle Obama, at the DNC in two, 2016, the Democratic National Committee. Uh, that is, the, and this is a quote from her wonderful speech. That is the story of this country. Today, I wake up every morning in a house that was built by slaves, and I watch my daughters, two beautiful, intelligent, black young women playing with their dogs on the White House lawn. So we know the White House and the Capitol building were built um, at least 200 known enslaved laborers. It was also built by free blacks, white laborers, and immigrants from Ireland and Scotland between 1792 and 1800, which of course is um, you know, about 50 years prior to Govins. Uh, interestingly, because of the, um, the importance of our national buildings in, in um, Washington, They've also done a lot of research on the Smithsonian Institution and found that the sandstone was quarried by enslaved. And um, there was oral history saying that for many years, but finally someone did his, um, some uh, research and was able to determine that. So here we have, I, I'm laying the sort of uh, framework for what we know about building construction in that era because it's, it's not easy to know from records who built Govins. So like a lot of my research, I've tried to look at the cultural context. And uh, for decades, they've been trying to find records about who uh, built the, the uh, Maryland State House. And they have, they have some, some records, and again, a lot of oral history that says um, slaves worked on the State House. And here's a quote by a historian. One of the reasons that black history has not been told is because of white historians who say there's no proof, it's not written. You told us we couldn't even write, so what? <laughs> so who built Govain Chapel? Well, the best we can do is an educated guess, so we're gonna walk through that. Um, in Baltimore, the numbers of enslaved laborers decreased slowly but steadily across Maryland from the 1810s to the 1830s. And number of free blacks, particularly in urban areas, was on the rise. Uh, free blacks, there were thousands of enslaved escaped bondage to the city of Baltimore between 1800 and 1860. Uh, and by 1860, there were 27,000 African Americans in Baltimore and 90% of them were uh, free. So these are paintings of um, um, unidentified people. And the middle one is Frances Ellen Walker Harker, who was a free black in Baltimore, a poet and an activist. So um, Baltimore at that time had expansion population growth. A lot of that was from runaway slaves, um, also white men driven to the city by changes in the rural agriculture and um, a lot of German and Irish immigrants. And of course we were, well not of course, but um, we were in the county, Govins was in the county at the time. And uh, there were thousands of people moving through the uh, county en route to points north so in the county also, there were large numbers of both free and enslaved blacks. Um, the agricultural trends were changing, which also um, impacted the use of labor. Um, and we didn't have a lot of cotton in, in our area, the Piedmont area, we had tobacco growing in other parts of Maryland, but we dominated the world wheat and flour markets into the 19th century. Uh, Baltimore County had rich deposits of iron ore, and we had a lot of water power from the Patapsco River and the Jones Falls. So we had a lot of mills uh, milling. That was a big industry, milling all this wheat. 
Um, Baltimore County had 40,000 residents by 1830, with a lot of mills and farming accounting for most of the growth. So the trend was in Maryland um, that we were going from a slave society to a society in which slaves were just one type of labor. Uh, and we, we would call that the mobile workforce. So, you know, job related workforce, not, not um, in situ slavery. So there was free and un unfree labor. Work sites were not segregated by race. Slaves worked among free laborers, black and white, and there was high demand for work due to the tremendous growth in Baltimore at that time. <clears throat> so it was all about the money, the intersection of race and labor um, people who were hiring for projects were trying to maximize their profits. So as they established a working pool, they balanced the capital investment in a slave with the risk of a f um, free white man's walking off the job. Um, and a, a, a practice that was very common in Maryland was called gradual manumission. And that meant that uh, you would promise freedom for the work. And the thought was that if you were going to promise the freedom, then the, the laborer was less likely to um, flee for freedom and more likely to stay and finish the job and then be um, given freedom. But the threat of flight was very much in the calculation as people established a labor force for projects. So who built Gobain Chapel then? Slaves? I'm going to give you a little test. Free Blacks, <laughs> Irish and German immigrants, all of the above. <laughs> uh, but uh, even so, you know, race mattered. And this is a book that someone has written about this um, topic. Um, hiring practice were not blind to race and status. Black workers um, were assigned typically at the most difficult jobs, dangerous and the lowest paying jobs. Um, and the quote from the book is, the intersection of race and labor were unpredictable and inconsistent, but not random. So uh, people with wealth who were hiring did a lot of calculations on how they were gonna convene their labor force. So then in conclusion, we know that Govin's founders owned slaves and that some slaves may have built the structure. But in many ways, I think we're kind of missing the point because it, it's, it, it's, I think, um, human nature to want to directly assign it to our, our, our project, but really it's the economy, stupid. <laughs> it's not- everything being built in Baltimore at that time was being built by the same mix of labor. Yeah, yes. And, and not just the construction industry, but all our industries were based on the slave economy. So whether we had people building here or whether the, the, our founders had slaves really is kind of incidental to the question of our complicity as a society, because if we were living at the time and, and living now, we are still um, but, benefiting. But, but your statistic was only 10% of the African American population was slaves. And that was in, you know, slicing and dicing data is a challenge, especially since I'm not spending my life doing this. That was 1860. We were built in 1844. But there was a trend towards that. Yeah, okay. Yes. So it's probably the balance might have been a little different than that. So, um, Slavery from the very beginning drove Maryland's economy. There were 13 slaves on the Ark and the Dove when they got here. Um, and the 17th and 18th century commodities produced the, uh, formed the foundation of Maryland's economy. Um, we had tobacco plantations and those tobacco plantations allowed the gentry to um, expand their wealth and power. And by the 19th century, slaves were throughout Maryland through tobacco plantations, iron forest um, furnaces, brickyards, lime kilns, wheat farming, ship caulking. Uh, our economy was 
was really ticking. Now, this is Cecil Calvert, and I learned that he never came to Maryland, but he was our first Lord <laughs> granted. Now, his uh, the third Lord, Charles Calvert, did come to Maryland. He did great things for our economy. Um, he was the first to mandate in Maryland that once a slave, a slave for life. And we were a leader in that. He was the first what? Once, in 1663, he mandated that once a slave, you were a slave for life. Oh, right. And that your children would be slaves for life. And a lot of states followed that. You know, there was slavery, but then there had to be laws put in place for, you know, governing these people. And we were good at that. <laughs> so that was, you know, one part of the economy. Another uh, is, which is that, which was basically everything and how we divided our, our labor and our wealth. But another part of our economy, which was big in Baltimore when Govins was established, was the Baltimore slave trade, which was pretty hor horrific. Um, although the, the you know, United States banned the transatlantic slave trade in 1808, um, what resulted in that was then that the slaves that we had became traded and they became commodities. And um, a domestic trade from the upper south to the emerging cotton growing regions of the deep south thrived until the 1860s. Baltimore based dealers supplied the trade operating slave pens at the inner harbor on Fells Point and across the city, including uh, near this location where this sign is. Between 1808 and the abolition of slavery in Maryland in 1864, an estimated 30,000 people were sold south from Baltimore. Um, Govain Chapel, just to remind you, was built in uh, 1844, and this, this um, ad was placed in the Baltimore Sun, Negroes Wanted. Uh, and this was part of the, the slave trade by this guy, Hope Slatter. Um, and part of the dynamic in Baltimore was that our tobacco economy was sagging and a lot of the slaves in our region had been brought here to support the tobacco economies. So we had economy. So we had an excess of slaves. Uh, there was limitless demand for cotton, which was just increasing. Uh, and we've all heard of the cotton gin, but I guess I've learned through my research and it's finally finally sunk into my brain, you know, I probably learned that in fifth grade or something, oh, the cotton shit. <laughs> but now I really understand. It's just, you know, like gangbusters, there was no limit to the um, cotton that could be produced and no limit of the demand. Do you have any idea what slave cost? I mean, what, uh, or what it would be in this day? Yeah, I, I'm not on the top of my head. I've yeah. seen numbers all the time, but it's I guess. Oh, here we go. Okay. Yeah, this ad. Yeah. Um, I will also receive and keep Negroes at 25 cents each day because he, you could bring them to his pen and be, they could be kept there like a kennel, right? That's like bring in your I dog. Actually, that's what I think of. Do you think it was really like? Yes. <laughs> So we'll, ha we'll have actually a, um, a testimony about this particular place in a minute. Um, my establishment is large, comfortable area and all above ground and kept in complete order with a large yard for exercise. And it's the strongest and most splendid building of the kind in the United yeah, States. <laughs> yes, whoops. Uh, yeah, that was the ad. Okay. Oh, oh, no, 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 slatter, it, it, that, it'll become more clear in a minute. Um, okay, what did I do? No. Oh, you can see it, but I've got, um, okay, so we'll just keep going. <laughs> My screen got messed up. Um, so. See all your screens. We see every, we see every, there you go, now you fixed it. Oh, you do? Okay, here we go. All right. So. Um, so I mentioned the 1808 that there was a law passed federally that you could not uh, bring slave, the slave trade was, was shut down coming from Africa. But then there was an in, a whole industry set up here, which was kind of an unintended consequence. Two million slaves were sold south, not from Baltimore, but sold south because that was just a trend of selling south to support the, um, co the uh, cotton industry. 30,000 from Baltimore. So this is a map of all the uh, sellers, the traders in Baltimore. 
each one of these that we know of. Each one of these dots is a slave trader. And the um, one on the left is Slatter's House, which is the ad that I just showed. Okay. So we have a first person um, account of an abolitionist who, who visited the Slatter's House. So on the bottom right is the, uh, the Signal of Liberty, was, which was actually a paper from Ann Arbor, Michigan for abolitionists. So we were nationally known <laughs> for what we were doing down here. And I'll read that. Um, the prison, so if abolitionists came down and visited, the prison is situated on one of the most public streets of the city. And in the rear of the dwelling and office of the owner, a simple sign on which was inscribed the name of the dealer in human flesh hung over the office door. There was nothing upon it, however, to indicate the hard business in which he was engaged. And yet I am told that Mr. Slatter is a man of so much natural amiability in the ordinary intercourse of life that no one would suspect him of being engaged in an occupation which sunders the holiest ties of our nature. I am half inclined to conclude that they have by some strange process <laughs> conquered a peace with their consciences. Here I saw nearly a hundred human beings of all ages and both sexes locked up like so many wild beasts and awaiting purchasers. So that was another industry, the slave industry. Um, but there were more industries that, that came from um, slavery and, you know, directly from slavery in the cotton industry. And that is our, um, our mills, cotton mills. So this is a picture of Ham Hamden and Woodbury. We had um, eight cotton mills in a foundry that date from 1806 to 1904. Um, the economic center of industry for Maryland from the 1850 to, until the 80s were, the, were these mills. So, um, that was uh, a summary of all the trends that might have influenced both the building of our building, but also the basic economy of Baltimore. And no matter who was living here, we all were benefiting, either benefiting or not benefiting, depending on who you were, of the basic industry. So, 1846. 1844 was, was the beginning of our, um, our, our church, um, but it was constructed, it was finished in 1846. Um, and it was a union chapel at that time, which means that we had uh, Presbyterians, Protestant, Episcopal, Methodist, mm -hmm. and Baptists. Mm -hmm. And the first um, minister was 1846. And that would have been a minister assigned to us. And similarly, in 1850, we had another minister then there was uh, Robert C. Galbraith, who, who um, served for 13 years, 12 years. Uh, and he led us into the Civil War and through the Civil War. So he was our first real um, assigned uh, hired minister. And there's Mark, a picture Carl, of him. Was that, does that mean that you had Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterians all worshiping together, or were they sharing the? Uh, that's a good question. I think they were sharing the building. Okay. Um, that's the uh, the definition of a union chapel is is sharing the building. Okay. Yeah. But, but it became Presbyterian very in, early. In then. 1846, it was chartered as a Presbyterian church. Uh, yes. It, it, it existed for two years before that. Right. Um, but then uh, everybody continued to be welcome, I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, they needed the anchor of a denomination and the Presbyterians uh, were... Well, Turnbull was Presbyterian. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> but, yeah. And, and some of the people came from First Church, I believe. Well, he was First Church, so there probably were others, too. Yeah, but he, he was First Presbyterian, um, which is the First Presbyterian Church in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. Turnbull previously was, the, was an elder there, was a deacon there actually. Um, so uh, we know that uh, from literature that we have in the church that um, Mr. Galbraith every Saturday um, administered to the slaves at the Hampton Plantation. 
He officiated two weddings there, and he left, ba but then he left Baltimore in 1865, the year the Civil War ended. So this really piqued my curiosity about who this man was. And as I performed my research, I realized that if I followed him, I really would learn a lot about the context in general. So it became a case study. So here's Eliza, Eliza Ridgely of the, pa uh, the plantation. It's a, it's a portrait, famous portrait by um, Sargent. And um, she hired Galbraith and they would conduct services in the top of this building here. Um, but then she also fired him for marrying a woman suspected of having African blood. Now this was before he became... No, this was while he was at Govins. Oh, while he was at Govins? Yes. So while he was at Govins, he administered, he would go out and administer to slaves in Hampton. Oh, I see. He, she hired him. Just to, to do that on Saturdays. Uh, okay. 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 Yes. Hired and him to fired. Admin, <laughs> And then fired him. Yes. Suspected him for her for marrying, because she married a white gentleman, a Caucasian gentleman? Uh, no, fired him hey, for marrying a woman who was suspected of having African hey, blood. He married her. He married her, yes. Oh, he, he Galbraith, called Galbraith. Bob, Bob, Sorry, Bob, I guess that's not Bob, clear, is it? Bob, yes, Galbraith married. So married. that's kind of all we know or knew when I entered this. It's like it's like gossip, right? I mean, yeah. we just knew that little smidgen of of information. So, so are I, you still researching Galbraith? Or you found all that you could find? I think I've found all that I can find. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're sharing today. <laughs> I mean, all I could find without spending my life on original research. So what's this mean to Govins? What was Galbraith's pastoral relationship with the slaves? Um, what were the norms of the times in imparting religious services to slaves? Is there evidence that he rose above his times? Who was Elizabeth Love? That was the person he married, which I um, found out a little bit later as I did research. Pretty early on in, in my research, I found this woman, Elizabeth Love. Great name, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Okay, um, how does this reflect in our history? And so I, I developed a, a case study that had the intersectionality of Presbyterianism, slavery, and racism. All right, so we talked, uh, last time we met, we reviewed this, so I'm just gonna review it very quickly. He has Scots-Irish ancestry. Uh, he grew up in, in Pennsylvania with very little exposure to slavery because of the Pennsylvania Act for the Gradual Abolition of Slavery, which means that by the time he was growing up, there wasn't much a practice of slavery in Pennsylvania. Uh, he went off to college, so he's a very educated man. He, did, he was quite a scholar, did very well at college. His um, father and, and um, others, his father was a minister, his, his eventual wife's, yeah, his father was a minister. Um, he then went to Pres uh, Princeton Seminary, and we know from our last presentation that, that, that Princeton um, is very disappointing in how they they call it now their original sin um, and how they did not uh, support abolition of slavery. Um, and then um, we also talked about the General Assembly's tragic failure to promote abolition. So this is the context that he grew up in and started his ministry. Then he went off to Virginia. Uh, he actually had wanted to go to India as a mission, but um, health, poor health prevented him from doing that. So he took a teaching position in um, Virginia, near Virginia, what is now Virginia Beach, at a private school in Princess Anne County for prominent citizens. At that time, there was no public funding for schools in Virginia, and Virginia was also very much behind other states. As it, it, there was a big conversation nationally about how to um, educate our citizenry. Um, some institutions, as a result, because there was no public funding, had endowments of slaves or used slave labor. Some schools even financed their institutions by hiring out, breeding, and selling slaves. And all we know about the place that he went to work was that he lived, this is the census um, data that I found, that he lived with 30 students and seven of those students, or seven of those, well, he lived with 30 people Seven of those people were slaves, and the, the rest seemed to be the students. 
So those slaves were either owned by the institution to support the school or the school could have been hiring. They probably, since they lived there, they probably owned them. Both practices would happen. And some schools actually hired out their own slaves as a way of financing their institutions. So um, he actually became ordained in, in Virginia. And this was the church where he was ordained. Um, it was the first Presbyterian church in Virginia. And it was also um, the place that was founded by um, Samuel, um, I'm having a, a, a I'll, I'll talk about that later. <laughs> uh, it comes up later, I can't remember his name. So anyway, this, what? Well, no, this is another Samuel. So a uh, hundred years ago, there was another guy who is gonna be coming up, but this is the pastor who was there at the time. Reverend Samuel Ketzel Pastor. And so th this, you know, would be reflective of some of, some of what was going on um, in Virginia. He was a brilliant student, graduating with high honors. He was Presbyterian. And he argued a biblical defense for slavery, which a lot of ministers were doing in the South at that time. He actually was from Georgia, this minister. He was very well known and broadly published in the South from 1843 to 1861, and believe what the Old Testament commanded and the New Testament permitted could not be wrong for the South. He was also a poet. Oh, so here we have Slavery in White and Black. This is a contemporary, this is a, a recent publication. And I, I put it here because it indicates how important this guy was. You know, he's written about in contemporary um, literature, how, how he preached. So he was at the this church when Galbraith, um, there he is, in his own words, Christ and his apostles acted upon the ground that slavery was lawful. Slavery is not traffic in human blood. Slavery refers to service, not flesh, to labor, not to human nature. It may be that God designs to accomplish some great and good part in the evangeliz evangelization of the world by the Christian slaves of America. Doubtlessly vast good is designed to be accomplished by it. So, um, you know. Slavery is good for you. Yeah. <laughs> so you need, I mean, this guy, you know, he looks like a nice guy, right? And you read about him in other dimensions and, you know, he's supposed to be a great, a great um, pastor. And he, um, he administered to the slaves, you know, and here he is using the Bible to promote it. But that isn't Galbraith you're quoting. No, that's not Galbraith. That is the pastor who was at the church at the time where Galbraith was yeah. then ordained. So it, it it's some representation of some influence that may have been, because we know we don't know a lot about Galbraith. We know where he went and what he did, but we don't have his own words and we don't have his no. sermons. Uh, the this pastor, not Galbraith. Yes. Yeah, Beth says that they're that he's more of a thought leader of the time. Of the time. There you go. Thought leader of the time. Yes. Good. And why? Why is it that we did not have sermons? Well, we had a, a fire uh -huh. that burned a lot of our archives. I have not gone to Philadelphia, which is another thing to do. Uh, so I have found what I can find through the web and through what we have here. But my legs have not gone elsewhere, <laughs> and I don't know that my time will. Uh, so it'd be a great project for someone to take on. And, you know, anyway. Um, the abolition Southern evangelizing paradox, which like Beth was saying, that thought leaders were talking about this in Virginia at the time. And, but ironically, anti-slavery um, in the North actually increased the evangelization of the Negro in the South. Um, all Southern churches, excepting the Quakers, became pro-slavery and defended the system with the Bible. Um, while abolition organizations increased in the North, missions among slaves multiplied in the South. Mm -hmm. So pastors wanted to tend to the souls of those that were in bondage and the more the abolitionists called for their freedom, 
the more the Southern churches felt that they needed to tend to the souls of these enslaves. Well, they had to reconcile. Yeah, yeah. They, they dug, they weren't gonna, right. Yeah. They weren't gonna rock Testify. the boat. Testify. Yes. Yeah. So um, after the school which, where he stayed for four years, he then moved to Brunswick, Virginia in 1844 when Govins was built, right? So this is where Galbraith was as we were developing our church. He preached and taught slaves and possibly free blacks in Brunswick. Uh, he was there with his wife and Mary and four-year-old son. Um, and the context there was that tobacco was in decline. They were still growing tobacco there. Um, so there, and there was chattel slavery there. So as I said before, like in Baltimore, they had an excess number of slaves there. So they were selling a lot of slaves south. So that's the context that he would be in there. Okay, here is the guy that I was thinking of. Yes. Samuel Davies, okay, was a hundred years prior. So what led Galbraith to preaching to slaves in Virginia? So the quest, first mm -hmm. question is, was it something about the heritage there? And this would be related to Samuel Davies. And Samuel Davies, he didn't call for the freedom of slaves, but he did treat them with great dignity, which was remarkable for the time. And this was during the first awakening um, many enslaved people at that time joined the church. He came down from, it was either York or Delaware, I'm, I'm forgetting now. Um, and he, he actually came to Virginia for this ministry uh, and he formed the Hanover Presbyterian, which then a hundred years later was that church where Galbraith became ordained. And Samuel Davies is part of our heritage. He would have known about Davies. So he, you know, it's possible he went down to preach to slaves in Virginia based on the heritage he knew about Samuel Davies and how he treated slaves and evangelized the slaves. We don't know. Um, so um, what led Galbraith to preaching to slaves in Virginia? Well, there was another climate which was after Nat, Nat Turner Rebellion. Nat Turner Rebellion was in 1831, and it was the, the bloodiest slave rebellion in U.S. history. Um, an enslaved preacher, Nat Turner, and 60 other men killed 58 white women and children in Southampton County, Virginia. So the, there's the map of Virginia, and the star is where Galbraith was teaching in the school, mm -hmm. And then he went west, and this would have been um, less than 10 years, you know, maybe seven years after the Turner Rebellion. Um, and the circle, so the, the circle to the left is where that rebellion occurred. And this, I'm sorry, the circle to the right is where the rebellion occurred. The circle to the left is where Galbraith then uh, landed a preaching to to slaves. And one of the things that happened after, a lot of policies happened after the Nat Turner Rebellion in response to it. Um, and uh, they said Virginia passed a lot of laws. Virginia actually, prior to the uprising, had a lot of dialogue about, you know, how, how to handle slavery. Um, but when, when the rebellion, and there were a couple of rebellions happened, people really reacted strongly. White ministers, um, and one of the laws that was passed was white ministers were required for religious meetings. So there, there were black pastors attending to uh, blacks in the area, but legally they were no longer able to do that. So um, um, I surmise that Galbraith knew that and uh, so there were places where he thought he could be of help. Um, well, you got to credit him for getting into his fishermen. I mean, he, he put his life at risk for, yeah. uh, for doing that. So uh, I, that I've been trying hard to be objective, mm -hmm. but I also know that internally I'm rooting for this guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we don't know, but I think there's, and well, I'll, I'll show you some summary information. There's indications that he, you know, that, that he was in it for the right reason, but we, you know, we don't know. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I have learned in my research also is that I believe that your background 
uh, really informs who you became and the North and, you know, whether you grew up with slavery or not would, would influence who you became as a person. Mm -hmm. So I think he's coming South from the North, from Quakerville. <laughs> and I'd like to think that he, um, he was preaching for the right reason. Um, I don't know whether he was uh, preaching because they wanted white ministers to evangelize the slaves or whether he was preaching to them, like to teach them while also helping them to read and write or to help them form their own yes. religious beliefs. Both were going mm -hmm. on. And last time we met, we talked about a guy, for example, Colcott, who had very sinister reasons for preaching to the slaves. And they had more to do with controlling their behavior and making them more docile and making them understand who was master and who was slave. And, uh, and both things were going on. So what, where Galbraith aligned, we don't know, but he has some background that would hope he aligned in a more sympathetic place than some others. Um, so the reactions of white evangelical Christians in the South to Nat, Nat Turner's revolt has, a, this, this is a piece that I, that I found very interesting, has received little attention from historians. So this one historian who wrote this thesis wanted to look at, well, what was the reaction? Because you know, history likes sound bites. And so one of the sound bites about this time in history in Virginia is, okay, there was a revolt and then there was a bad reaction. Um, and this researcher thinks that the, yeah, the evangelical community was more nuanced, but that there was also both. At least in Virginia, the lines of demarcation between black and white were not absolute, even in the wake of the Nat Turner revolt. The races shared fellowship with each other and whites in Virginia often overlooked or actively disobeyed repressive legislation to, to, to defend blacks' involvement in religious activity and leadership. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I was doing my dissertation, I'm sure I'd find a lot of things all over the place mm -hmm. <laughs> and where it all ends. Uh, you know, this is this one person's orientation. Um, so here we have um, what led Galbraith preaching to slaves, demand for white preachers, which I talked about. Well, here is a preacher who was doing that work before the rebellion, John Chavez, and he actually studied in New Jersey. He was from the South. Uh, he was a licensed preacher, commissioned to preach, um, and circuit riders, what they called um, ministers who were not assigned to a church, but would go around preaching. So he did that until 1831 and then it was not legal for him anymore after the revolt and the passage of this legislation to preach. <clears throat> so he would, lost his position and there was a market for someone like Galbraith. That restriction was only in Virginia or? It was uh, there was a lot of laws in different states as well, but that was the Virginia law. And um, yeah. Uh, so, religious instruction of the Negro for the Presbyterians. Um, in 1834, the Synods of Virginia, the Carolinas, Georgia came together, um, and their orientation was to develop a program to save fallen humanity. Uh, it actually failed because it was too large, and they ended up thinking that individual synods could work best separately. So that's an indication of, you know, again, the reaction, well, what do we do? And, um, and you know, one orientation which Mr. Liu had, or Dr. Liu had when we had him here was, well, so what? I mean, you know, these, this was good that they wanted to administer to their souls, but Presbyterians very strong, very clearly were not demanding abolition. <laughs> so I, I wanna make that distinction. So Galbraith moves to Baltimore in 1848. Um, he was in Brunswick for four years. While there, he had three additional children for a total of four and traveled 200 miles north to Baltimore, which would have been quite a feat. So this map is a map of percentage of um, the total population of blacks and the total population. So in Brunswick, it was 65%, not black, slaves, sorry. 
65% in, um, of the population in Brunswick, where he was, were slaves. And in Baltimore, there's 6%. So he's making a big move. I, I imagine it's probably more money. He's got four kids, right? Uh, I'm going to Baltimore. The money is, you think, the draw for him? Oh, I don't know. But I'm just speculating on someone with a family. And, you know, I mean, his wife went down there with her, bless her heart. <laughs> And Mary is his first wife. Elizabeth yes. Is his second wife. Uh, Elizabeth is his third. Uh -huh. So, yes, he's still with Mary, his first wife. Did these ladies die? Yes. Uh, <laughs> Ma Myra, Myra, can I interrupt just for a second? Yes. It's five of. Yeah. Whether, whether you would, would you like to continue next week or uh, um, are we uh, so people, um, folks can go to the service or, or well, continue another time, part three? Yeah, I guess so. We still aren't going to know, right? <laughs> we know a little bit more. You, you have a way of keeping us on tender hooks. <laughs> okay, um, sure. This would be good. He's coming to Baltimore now. This is a good place to stop, I guess. <laughs> so there you go. I mean, I'm good either way. I actually have to go to the second service. Okay. Um, so I, I don't have any choice. So we, we will catch you hopefully. Uh, uh, Jenny says, please more and more. So maybe next week, stay tuned. Uh, there'll be, there'll be an announcement um, in the, you know, the usual weekly email. And this is, this is terrific. You just stimulate so many questions and discussion by the fascinating material and presentation that. Uh, okay. Any questions? <laughs> I'll take questions before I leave. I want to find out why you're so rooting for Saga. Um, is this a sense that you got that he's a good guy deep down? Well, I guess it comes from a couple of places. One is I don't want to judge him without evidence. Mm -hmm. That doesn't seem right, mm -hmm. even though we have all the, you know, I don't want to say he. Um, and the other, I think, is just um, he's one of us. Yeah. You know, I think it's. Up. I, I want him. It, it's a yeah. reflection on me, I guess, right? So that's what I say. I'm really I'm trying to be objective because I think I have to bump up against that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, we'd like to think that the first minister of this church was a good guy. Exactly. Well, and he's kind of cute. <laughs> <laughs> I like his picture. <laughs> well, that baby guy looked like uh, and a you know. The, yeah. When you read about, uh, so there's there's secondary stuff about him, you know, like um, in, in Presbyterian land, there's summaries of ministers and stuff. And of course, they're going to talk positively. Um, uh, but they say, you know, that he was um, you know, an amazing scholar. When he, well, you're going to find out he preaches at, at the first African-American church in Baltimore and, you know, successfully and they all loved him you know I, I don't know if that's true but that's what it says <laughs> so, yeah i would yeah yeah thank you you're yeah. welcome thank you well done you're welcome okay thanks myra well i did you know if people hadn't stopped me, I, I would have gotten further. <laughs> but it's no, enjoyable. Yeah. Okay. So that was slide. I'm just curious what slide is that. Well, hopefully we'll see you next week then. Oh, so there's nobody scheduled next week? There's nobody scheduled. Let, you've just saved me ahead of Ah, oh, okay. Good job, Myra. Good, Good job, everybody who asked questions and slowed her up. All right, so I'll try to leave it as it is rather than throw more stuff in because that's what keeps happening. I keep throwing more stuff in. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you all. Thanks, Bye -bye. Myra. Well done. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, Ben. Ask Ben, does he have anybody for May 15th?